I'd arrived home about 15 minutes ago and was surprised to find my wife, Molly, not home yet. She worked a few hours a week, but she was still usually ahead of me and had dinner ready by the time I showed up at the door. I grabbed a beer and was about to call her to find out about dinner plans, but she beat me to it and my cell phone rang. Hey honey, are you still at work? I inquired. Yes, Jack, I'm still here, but we were just leaving. I have a surprise for you that I think you'll like, at least I hope you do. I know I'm going to like it. We need to talk when I get home, so please make sure you're around and ready to talk when I get there. I'll be home in 20 minutes. Should I start dinner or run out to get something? No, Jack, we won't have time for that tonight, at least not until later in the evening. But, Jack, just remember that I love you, and only you, and I can't wait to see you again. I love you too, and we'll be waiting for you with open arms. 20 minutes later, my wife Molly walked in, and I immediately noticed that she looked a little wrinkled, her clothes were wrinkled, her stockings were missing, and her makeup and hair were a little messed up. Wow, you must have had a rough day, Molly. You look kind of disheveled. What's the matter? Molly quickly walked over to me, wrapped her arms around me, and, looking into my eyes, whispered, Jack, you know I love you very much, and I know you love me and would do anything for me. Do you agree? Sure, Molly. I may not kill for you, but I'm willing to do anything else. So, why this conversation? I can't wait to find out what predicament you're in this time. Nothing of the sort, Jack. Just let me do the talking, and when I'm done, you can ask me questions. You know how you let me make almost all of our decisions? You're so kind and loving to me that you let me do almost anything I want. So, I was telling my boss, Ralph, about our relationship over the past few weeks, and he had a few ideas that seemed reasonable. He had me read some stories and a magazine about submissive men who like to dominate their women and how it helps their relationships. I have to admit, Jack, those stories were very erotic and really got my fantasies going over the last few weeks. Molly, yes, I am kind to you and let you make any decisions that aren't life-changing or serious. But, if you remember, I made decisions about the house we would buy, the cars we would buy, how we would invest our money, and major financial decisions. But I admit, I like to let you make decisions about the things that are important to you, that make you happy, like vacations, what movies to see, what restaurant to go to, even what clothes I should wear. But I don't think that makes me submissive. I just love you and want you to be happy. My dad told me that the secret to a happy, stress-free marriage is to not worry about the little things, then he reminded me that almost everything is little things, and life should be lived as positively and happily as possible. Okay, Jack, but I still think my boss was right when he compared you to him. He's bossy, overbearing, and takes what he wants. People obey his strong personality and do what he decides, not the other way around. He explained to me that he is an alpha male who is dominant and comes first, and people like you, although they are loving and sweet, are more like beta males who like to dominate and be submissive. They may not know it yet, but it's already there and waiting to happen. Well, I think that's third-degree pop psychology nonsense, and I totally disagree with it, but what's your point? When I said that, I saw some guilt in Jack's eyes, and the confidence I had before faded a bit. Jack, my boss told me he was going to dominate me in bed and F me like I've never been had before. I know it's wrong, and I may have crossed a line that a young married wife should avoid, but it really turned me on. For the past few weeks, I've had fantasies about him seducing me in the office. He explained to me that you would probably really enjoy my intimacy with him, that you as a submissive might even want to watch, and if not, that you and I will have the most incredible sex of our lives when you take me back to yourself after I have a dirty session with him. I stared at her, waiting to see what she was about to say, but I suddenly realized that she was being serious and that she did have feelings for him, and who knows what else. What the hell, Molly? You've got to be kidding me. How could you think I would put up with this? Jack, I know you love me and want me to be happy. I'm convinced that this will take our love and our sex life to a whole new level. Molly, are you telling me you had sex with your boss? What the hell were you doing, Molly? Oh no, Jack. I would never cheat on you, BS. You've already cheated, you've had intimate conversations with Ralph, 
and you've already told me you fondled him. Did he fondle you? She lowered her eyes and, without looking me in the eye, replied, No, Jack, not yet. He fondled me in the car when we drove here, and now he's waiting in the driveway while we talk, and then he'll come up to our bedroom and we'll have sex. You can watch if you want. Ralph will love it, but if not, when we're done, you can come upstairs and take me back, and I'll let you do anything to me that you could ever fantasize about. You're fing kidding me. He's outside right now, and you let him stroke you and believe his delusions? Just the thought of being with you after you've been with him makes me want to puke. And what will happen now, Molly, if I say no and ask you to send him away? There was panic in Molly's eyes now. It was obvious that she wasn't ready for that answer. Now she was obviously going to take a tougher approach, probably instructed by her slimeball boss. Jack, you love me, and I want that. You've always let me get what I want, so I figured it would be good for us. We'll try it at least once, though I'm sure it will be so good we'll probably want to continue. Now I'm going to go upstairs and make things pretty for him, and for you. You can let him in and then wait until we're done. I know you'll want this for me because you love me, and I know it will be so good for us. Well, Molly, I can see what's on your mind, and that our marriage and vows are apparently a thing of the past, so you go and get ready, while I go out and have a brief talk with your lover, Jack. He's not my lover. That's just raw, powerful, overbearing sex. I will always love only you, and I will forever be yours, and you will be mine. With those words, Molly reached up to hug and kiss me, but I pushed her away, seeing the surprise and hurt in her eyes. Well, don't let me hold you back, Molly. I can see that you'll do it no matter what I say, if not now, then soon, maybe without even telling me. Regardless, you've already effectively cheated on me, so go upstairs and get ready. Her look of guilt and shock at my statement made her pause, but she turned to leave. At the landing, she turned around and said, you'll see, Jack, it's going to be grand. Yes, Molly, it's going to be epic, you're right. After she climbed the stairs, I reached into her purse and pulled out her car keys, house keys, and phone. From her purse, I pulled out our joint credit card, and then I went into the kitchen and grabbed a tea towel from the linen drawer and some tie-downs from the utility drawer. I also grabbed a very large meat cleaver from the knife drawer and went out to meet Ralph. Ralph was sitting in his car in the driver's seat, reading his phone, and when I got out, he rolled down the driver's window and said, well, little Jack, I guess your wife told you the bill. Don't worry, I'll still let her have sex with you, at least for now, until she's completely under my power. You'll love it. I didn't let him finish that last statement. I put my whole body into the meanest, most vicious left hook I was capable of and punched him right in the nose. A satisfying crunch of bone and a trickle of blood confirmed that I had done the damage, as the blood dripped from his face onto his Brooks Brothers suit and the seat of his Mercedes. I handed him a tea towel and said, here, you'll need this, Ralphie. He quickly brought it up to his nose, and I wrapped the zipper around his left wrist, pulled it up, and looped it around the headrest bar and tightened the zipper. Then I opened the car door and gave him another left punch, but this one came right on his centroids, the family jewels. Yep, his notoriously large household. He sagged forward in his seat, curled up in a ball as far as he could with his left wrist tied to the headrest, but he managed to lean forward with his right hand, grabbing the steering wheel as he cried out in pain. I immediately took the opportunity to strap his right arm to the steering wheel. I leaned over to his face and said, so, is the big, strong dominant alpha male having trouble asserting himself? What a pathetic scumbag. You've analyzed me in this whole situation as poorly as you can, and you're going to learn the error of your ways. Unfortunately for you, Molly is expecting something big, so what do you say? Let's give it to her. I walked over to the front yard and picked up a watering hose lying in the grass, attached to it was a steel nozzle for spraying water, perfect for what I had in mind. I walked over to the car, swinging the hose close to my body like swinging a lasso or a sling, and after gaining acceptable speed and momentum, I launched it through the passenger window, shattering it into a pile of safety glass shards that covered the inside seat and floor of his car. Then I went to the front of the car and swung at the windshield. Again and again, although I didn't manage to shatter it after a couple of hits, it was covered in cracks and dents as if the car had been hit by golf ball-sized chunks of hail. 
I decided that since I was in the lead, I'd take out the headlights as well, and it gave me great pleasure. I went back to the driver's window and, laughing, said, looks like you're going to have to do some work on your car. I then grabbed a knife from my back pocket, quickly leaned over to the car, and put the knife to his neck, opposite his jugular vein. In my most intimidating voice, I hissed, how many times have you slept with my wife, trying to convince her that I would let it happen? I saw the fear in his eyes as he stammered, just twice in the last few weeks. It didn't mean anything, it was just sex for her and for me. Just let me go, and you'll never see me again. I looked at him like he was some kind of pathetic scumbag and said, I'm not going to kill you, at least not right now. But if I hear from the police, or if I get in any other trouble because of our conversation today, I'll come back to find you. If you go to the police, I'll probably go to jail, maybe I'll get bailed, maybe I won't, maybe I'll do time, maybe I won't. No matter, at some point in your future, I will find you, maybe in the parking lot as you walk to your car, maybe in the elevator at work. I will find you, slit your throat, and spit in your face as I watch you die. It's your choice, this could be the last time you see me, or you can watch me over your shoulder for the next week, month, year, until it's time to end you. With those words, I leaned over to him, stuck the knife in the passenger seat, and said, your whore Molly will need this to free you, so you can drive her away. Or maybe she'll take you to the ambulance. Whatever, the main thing is get her out of my sight. I went into the house, and when Molly heard the front door closed, she called out from the bedroom, is that you, Ralph? Come upstairs and get your whore. Did you straighten things out with Jack? My first thought was what an incredible whore. What kind of woman was that? I replied, Molly, Ralph is still in the car. He wants you to come out and talk to him. I think he might change his mind. A minute later, Molly came downstairs, no doubt wearing the lingerie I'd bought her under the robe I'd thrown on. What's wrong, Jack? Did you assure him everything was alright? Molly, I assured him that his future depends on how he acts. You should probably go out and talk to him. She threw me a confused look and said, Jack, please, remember that I love you, and it will make us stronger. Of course it will, Molly. I already feel stronger. She smiled and walked out the front door, and I immediately closed it behind her. I made my way to the garage and hit the garage door opener lock. It wasn't until I was going upstairs that I heard her screaming, What have you done, Jack? You have to come here and fix this. I ignored her pleas, went upstairs to the bedroom, and pulled out one of our carry-on suitcases. I pulled a whole bunch of clothes out of the drawers, panties, bras, socks. I pulled some t-shirts, jeans, and sweaters out of her closet and put them in the suitcase, then went to the bathroom and threw as much of her makeup, combs, brushes, and perfume into the suitcase as could fit. I went back to the closet and grabbed a pair of her tennis shoes, walked to the spare bedroom at the front of the house, opened the window, and shouted, Molly, over here. You might need these, and tossed the suitcase out into the driveway. I could only hope that some of the perfume bottles had broken, but whatever. Not my problem. Then, I threw the tennis shoes, aiming for her head, but she managed to dodge both of my throws. She looked at me with tears in her eyes and said, Jack, please, what are you doing? I was sure this is what you wanted. I'm sorry I didn't mean to make you angry or hurt you. I can't believe how cruel and mean you've been to Ralph, he's my boss, for God's sake. Please, Jack, let me in, and we can talk things over. I looked at her and said, Molly, I can't even tell you how ridiculous you've looked since you came home with your little ploy to turn me into your cuckold. I wonder if you've had a stroke, if you're on drugs, or maybe I just never knew how shallow and pathetic you really are. Whatever, it doesn't matter at this point. I want you out of here. You should probably take your lover to the hospital, but on the way, be sure to ask him about what will happen if word of tonight's actions reaches me from the police or anyone else. I'll pack the rest of your things into bags, and you tell me where to take them, but don't you dare come back to this house again. With those words, I slammed the window shut, went downstairs, opened the front door, and threw my purse at her head, this time at least hitting her in the chest before slamming the door shut. I couldn't resist adding, was that epic enough for you, Molly? I closed the door and made my way to the kitchen to open my second beer of the day. 
I realized that I needed to talk to a lawyer right away, just in case the police showed up. I also needed a recommendation for a good divorce lawyer. I walked to the front window and saw Ralph yelling and cursing at Molly while she cut the zippers. She put the suitcase in the trunk, he got out of the car, moved to the back seat, and lay down, and she got in the car, sobbing and looking like she was in shock, put it in reverse, and pulled out of the driveway. As the adrenaline in my system subsided, and I began to relax, I was completely shocked at what had happened, and how my wife had blown out of proportion so badly. I was amazed and a little frightened at what I had done in a fit of anger towards her boss. I was too close to actually slitting his throat, and now I realized that she just wasn't worth it. I laughed, remembering the crap he fed her about being an alpha and me being a beta. Being a nice, malleable guy and letting my wife have the final say in beneficial decisions was done out of love and a desire for a happy wife, a happy married life. But she must not have realized that kindness was a submissive beta personality that would allow her to cuckold me with a dumbass like Ralph. Wow, that's something I didn't expect. For the next few days, Molly didn't show up at the house. I kept getting calls from unfamiliar cell phones, and I assumed it was Molly since I had confiscated her phone. Finally, she left a voicemail, begging me to call her back at that number, so we could talk things over. I knew it was only a matter of time before I met with her, and considering the police never showed up to handcuff me, I figured I had already dodged one bullet, and now I had to end this fiasco. I called Molly and told her to come over in an hour, and we could talk. I hung up the phone, finished packing up the things in the house that I thought belonged to her, and sat on the front steps, waiting for her. Molly pulled up in her car, which she had obviously picked up from work. I didn't know if she was staying at Ralph's, her parents, a friend's, or a motel, and was a little surprised that I didn't care where she was. She hopped out of the car and waved uncertainly at me before walking over and sitting down next to me on the steps. Her face reflected many emotions, including shame, guilt, and apprehension. Her face looked swollen and blot shy, indicating that she had cried a lot and gotten very little sleep. She looked at me bashfully and said, Jack, I'm so sorry for what I did. I don't know how I let Ralph talk me into approaching you about having sex with him, and you being submissive and loving it. I think back over the last few weeks, and I don't understand how I fell for all that crap. I think it was all about his dominance and his insistence that it would be so good for us, and that I would have the best sex of my life, both with him and with you after him. Now I think about it, and you probably think I'm crazy, and I guess I was for a while, but Jack, now I'm back. I love you, and I only want you. I ask you to forgive me, and I promise I will be the best wife for you, and spend my life making it up to you. So, Molly, how did Ralph behave in bed? Did you get the fantastic ecstasies you apparently dreamed of? Stop it, Jack. I never touched him after that, and he was so freaked out by what you said that he dismissed me and won't go near me. Besides, he was in the hospital for two nights after what you did to him. He made up a story about a robbery on the way to the hospital, and we both stuck to that version, so you wouldn't get hooked. Well, at least he was right about one thing. What do you want, Molly? Jack, I want you. I want to come home and be your wife for the rest of our lives. I want you to forgive me. I'll do anything to make it up to you. We can get through this and be better than ever. Jack, I've decided that you're the only person I can love, and I need you to forgive me. What do you say, Jack? Can I come home? Molly, I've been doing a lot of thinking, and this is what I've come to, you and I have loved each other for two years and have been married for three years now. After only five years, you're obviously bored with our life, or at least our sex life, and you're looking for more. You may think you love me, and maybe you do, but you certainly don't respect me. There's no way you'd think of me as some submissive beta male who would willingly let you F your boss and make me clean up after him if you had any idea what love or respect really is. Besides, Molly, you cheated on me. Ralph told me that you slept with him at least a few times in the previous weeks while he was talking you into this alpha beta male be your lust took over your vows and promises you made to me, and again, this is after only 5 years. What happens in 7, 10, 15, or 20 years? How many times will you be bored and break those vows? Jack, I would never do that to you. You've already done it, Molly, so don't say never. 
No, I've thought this through. We don't have children, we don't have much savings, and our only real asset is the house, which has very little equity. I have decided, Molly, that the risk of staying with you is far greater than the benefit. I truly believe it's only a matter of time before you decide to have an affair, and judging by the way things went with Ralph this time, you'll just go behind my back. I don't trust you anymore, and worse, I've lost respect for you. I can't be with someone who doesn't respect me, and who I no longer respect. Molly had started crying as I explained my decision to her, and now she was sobbing when I told her it was over between us. Molly, we're getting a divorce. You're keeping your car, I'm keeping mine. We can split the savings, sell the house, and walk away. We're both still young, and I hope to start over with a man who will love and respect me for who I am. I've already hired a lawyer for the divorce, so we can do it amicably, or you can, and probably should, hire your own lawyer. Now let's load your stuff in the car, and you can go off and sleep with as many alpha males as you want. I'll start moving next week so we can put the house on the market. No, Jack, no. You have to forgive me. I need you. I love you. I respect you. It was just a mistake. I was dragged into, you have to forgive me, Molly. I'm sorry. I've said everything I wanted to say. Now it's time for me to move on with my life, and if our paths cross in the future, let's just say hello, but let's walk past. And I hope you find what you are looking for. With those words, I started loading her things into the car, and when we were done, I just looked at her, said goodbye, walked into the house, and closed the door on our marriage.